Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, like Chris, this is a piece of work which uh, I've been working with uh, uh, two of my colleagues uh, for some time, and actually it's in the second round now. Um, it's in a special issue in sociology, on, uh, sociology journal on paradoxes, and uh, we are the only sort of tech guys, I guess, in that special issue. With two of my colleagues, uh, many of you know, know them, uh, Karsten Sørensen from LSE and uh, David Tilson, who is currently, has been many, many years from the University of Rochester. And we wrote a couple of papers earlier in uh, infrastructuring and, and uh, paradoxes of that. And this is a, a related piece which emerged from some discussions around some conditions in some parts of the growth, which enabled the growth in digital innovation in a sort of large scale. So the background is the following. Uh, we can uh, understand generally that uh, digital innovation in a large scale is about reconfiguring, modifying, expanding social order by technological means. That's a very broad definition which sort of fits with our uh, sort of positioning. Also in the sense that, of course, it sort of aligns with the earlier uh, industrial revolutions, otherwise we changed life if you look at the industrial revolution in a similar way. Of course, um, uh, digital innovation has some specific aspects which we will, I, come, I, will, I will come later, which makes it difficult or uh, different to understand and it has certain specific unific aspects which have to be taken into account, uh, some of which we, we covered yesterday, for example, by uh, Ali Vahmas in his talk. Uh, one aspect of that is, uh, is that uh, in order to actually create any type of new social order, reconfigure it, you have to establish categories which define the, the order itself. And which also positions the people in the fields and positions to act in light of that order. They have to understand the categories which uh, define that order. Uh, so it's also about shifting and established categories and organizational boundaries, for example, which, which defines what are the markets, what are the products. In order to op operate in the market, we have to agree that what these uh, different products means, for example. Uh, and that's one of uh, the challenge which you face as an innovator that you have to actually be able to create and justify and legitimize and make meaningful those categories. Uh, and it cre creates this creation of this novelty in some ways and making that novelty acceptable to the uh, wider audience and make it legitimate. Uh, so you have to be, have the capability to build these new meanings and then make them part of the new business pra practices. And if you look at uh, from the viewpoint of any type of digital innovator, uh, one challenge is that they, ha they have to work with and deal with these paradoxes, which is the paradoxes from moving from the old to the new. And how to overcome that and how to actually balance that, the difference between the, uh, the old categories and the new categories. Because they can only emerge from the established institutional order. And that's a paradoxical process because it requires a shift in the categories and uh, in the context of digital innovation, it uh, largely comes down to degenerativity, which is that uh, innov uh, digital innovation enables very, uh, not necessarily unbounded, but uh, highly uh, sort of expanded space of different ways in which you can configure. And, uh, and this also calls for a wide range of possibilities to talk of, establish and talk about different categories, how you do that. So the innovation space is, in some sense, unbounded. Uh, one of my colleagues, once titled one uh, uh, talk that uh, now when, when we can pretty much do anything, what should we actually do? <laughs> and that's largely in some sense also the question about how, what type of categories it define that what should we be doing? That's the sort of key point. Uh, if you look at institutional theory and institutional discussion about one of the pillars of institutions, which is the cognitive pillar which we're dealing here, uh, this is one example, of, basically, of institutional work, how, you, how agents build institutions and make them stay, make them, uh, make them uh, stable. And that, uh, that uh, requires, of course, the legitimacy of those categories, establishing legitimacy of the categories, or working out somehow that they at least appear to be legitimate in a certain context. Uh, uh, and this is sort of interesting aspect also that if you look at from the viewpoint of innovators, one of the challenges is, of course, that these new categories may be uh, against the way in which I have identified myself in this social order. And um, that's one of the reasons why we have, with, uh, Chris talked yesterday about, for example, Kodak. Kodak's problem wasn't really about uh, resources and even understanding and skills of doing digital cameras. It's lots, uh, it's, it's, 
main challenge was that the camera was defined as a social category of as a chemical analog product, and it also identified itself as a company, which was uh, which was proud of that, and it identified itself in that field. And moving to another field, which would have required to establish new categories, was the real challenge. And Tripsa's article is a, uh, where she studied that is a classical example of these types of category work, which failed. Now. Uh, I'm not going to go very deep into this. Uh, we wrote an article in 2017, which is pretty abstract. You can find it if you are interested in it, where we said that there are a large number of different types of categories, uh, tension paradoxes, which you have to deal with if you innovate in digital space. You can say that uh, and these emerge from the fact that uh, the technologies assume certain fixity. You have to have a certain fixed number of things to put together. But if you look at over time, digital innovation, the, the technologies change. We have 4G, 5G, 1G. Uh, different types of uh, chips, different types of other things. Uh, but over time, if you look at all these things have to be put into place and they have to some, somehow place together in order to make things work. Uh, so there's a, some sort of tension there, but there's also tension between the uh, tangible, uh, fixed of tangible things and the software itself. Software, as I pointed out, is a different type of thing. And you have to somehow balance that. That's the sort of work which uh, software architects and the sort of people who deal with that have to deal with and the related tension. And then you have to uh, localize all this behavior from the, the, this thing into the local, and you have to make it also appear it to be generic so that it can be applied across different contexts, which creates other types of tensions. And, and finally, you can also have a tension between the stability on this and the change, because in order to innovate, you have to enable change. And, and you, you have to balance that. And then the other one is that. Uh, who innovates, you, you have to control some parts of it, but on the other hand, you have to give autonomy to the actors to actually innovate. You have to balance that paradox. So you are, you are full of these types of paradoxes, uh, which you have to deal with. In the uh, 2010 paper, we largely actually talk about this type of paradox and this type of paradox, uh, uh, where we talk about the paradoxes of stability and change and of control and autonomy. Now, <laughs> Uh, paradoxes themselves are sort of persistent contradictions. You cannot avoid, they are there. You just have to live with them. Um, and the, uh, the way in which we approach in this case paradoxes is dialectic. So they're the opposing elements, like old and new, and over time they have to somehow merge together in a new type of solution, which is a Hegelian dialectic. Uh, and there are some type of, you overcome this natural inherent conflict between the opposing elements through this type of work which you do institutionally. So, uh, just a, one point of the, and we are focusing especially on the categories, which is the categories uh, which define what the innovation is in the market. Uh, so, uh, how to establish those categories and uh, how to sort of work with them. If you look at, in terms of this model, what we are really interested in in this case is that there is this software change and possibility for changing the sort of software capabilities. You can think of uh, Uber, which we will discuss. It was largely software innovation, which of course relied on the sort of access to global and local and so forth, but that's the right side point. It was, it, it, it was a new type of configuration of software capabilities. And, you, and it had to also relate it to a certain type of market and it had to allow certain type of control and autonomy between different things. It had to also be fit, fit it into the existing categories of what driving means or what the taxi service means. And the, the, the new innovation enables totally new way of thinking about uh, driving compared to the or taxi service compared to the old way. But at the same time, it has to be somehow fit it with the existing categories because if it doesn't fit, people wouldn't understand what the heck it is. So uh, that's the, largely the sort of type of paradoxes we are looking at. And how the sort of uh, innovators overcome or what it means they overcome these types of paradoxes in order to innovate. Uh, uh, so many times this requires that you shift the, op the meaning to the opposites. Or uh, uh, that uh, and, uh, these opposites overcomes, helps to overcome the way in which you uh, organize the commercial activities, how they will be regulated, and how control gets done. For example, if you look at taxi work, it's a, if you referred to yesterday, it's a licensed work, has been well, for a long time, I will show that. So uh, you have to start somehow working, if you innovate in that space, how you actually overcome those types of regulatory demands and what you do with them. Uh, uh, just a note on the research approach. You cannot do a uh, sort of single case study, or you can do it, but it's a historical case study. It's like a technological history. 
So what the, the data which we have in the paper is largely, largely retrospective, collected from multiple sources, historical data to analyze how certain social categories shift and what their, where the consequences for the business activity as they uh, emerged. Um, there are, as far as we know, there are very few studies of these types of cities currently. And we looked at three cases, uh, which is the uh, taxi work, uh, uh, musical experience, and how musical experience is defined uh, and packaged in a market. And the third one is uh, uh, how we define social relationships and how they become actually emerge as a commercial, commercially uh, mineable activity. So these are the ones which I'm talking about. Uberization of the taxi work, the, uh, digitalization of the sort of music experience, which is the sort of listening and, and how we sort of think about it, and digitalization of social relationships. This covers like different levels and types of category shift and, and, and as I feel time, very different in its case. How the, how the actual institutional work was done and what, and very different logics how they associate, which were associated with overcoming these types of paradoxes or how they stayed. And I'll, uh, the longest one is going to be the Uberization of the taxi work. It's probably most well known, most well debated, and it's also widely uh, contested. Still an issue which is ongoing in many ways. Uh, the, the, these are the sort of questions. Is Uber a taxi company or a matching platform? It, it, it itself claims that it's not a taxi company, it's a matching platform. So it should not be regulated as a taxi company. It should not be licensed as a taxi company. Uh, and you can understand why this is an important issue. Because if it comes, uh, if it's treated as a taxi company, it has to be organized in exactly the same way as other taxi companies in any, each of the region or, or, or area where it operates under the same auspices and regulations. And, and in many cases, when this has not been possible, it has actually moved out from those markets. Uh, is, and I'll go later on that actually the way in which this, the, it has also operated in the U.S. is very clever in this regard. Are in Uber uh, drivers, as a consequ consequence, that drivers, employees, or independent contractors? This is a big uh, uh, legal case which was just resolved in California where they decided actually that they are employees, not independent. Of course, you can think about the matching thing that becomes totally different, uh, how you run the, the platform, if they are employees. Um, is Uber service similar or different from taxi service as a social category as a result of that? It comes to boils down to this issue. Of course, you need, uh, at the end, these are largely resolved, in this case, many cases, in, uh, by courts, legal arguments. Because that's where the, the sort of arguments about where, how the social categories fit and what the consequences are for commercial activity are largely traditionally resolved. Well, if you look at the sort of history, uh, you can understand that this is not a sort of simple thing because it, it is a, a strong path-dependent inheritance of, of certain type of institutional arrangements to provide certain type of service and to provide certain types of guarantees for both sides uh, to get so, uh, to, to guarantee certain types of quality of service. If you don't know where it started, it started in 1588 when one of the captains of uh, uh, <coughs> Sir Walter Raleigh uh, started a, a horse carriage service in London in 1588. Uh, and, and it was for horse-drawn carriages. And the idea, of course, was then that the horses were, were running around the uh, streets of London and you could call them by waving hand. There, there were no phones, there were nothing else. That was the only means to sort of access them. So it was by place. Uh, it started to be regulated 70 years after that. So it's not a long time, but actually it's an amazingly short time, if you think of that, that it became probably there were all types of problems. So they figured out that we have to regulate it. The prices and also the security of the tribe, uh, the people. So uh, 1648, started regulated. The shape determined 1848, uh, especially in London, and it, it became because in England at that time was the leading sort of uh, economic power, it, uh, similar patterns were adopted actually across the globe with, with, uh, as an inherited. 1860, this license based on knowledge on routing, that's where the licensing became. You have to learn about 3,000 routes, 25,000 routes in London, and that has been part of that since then, if you want to be a taxi cab driver. 
uh, late 19th century, so early part of the uh, 20th century, that's been metered, uh, also licensed those, uh, and regulated by the meters. And uh, uh, 1904, first motor-driven taxi trap and before First World War, most of them uh, were not driven by horses, but by mo uh, motor engine. But the idea of a horse-driven carriage still applies. The same rules and regulations uh, apply to taxi cabs in London as, they, as if they were horse-driven. And the same idea that uh, you hail them by hand is still the, the key part of it. Now, technology evolves. And around 1916, you had access to two-way radios, so you could call from a phone call and call to the taxi driver anywhere in somewhere uh, in London. So people found out that uh, this was not regulated because it was not found out, uh, it, uh, it wasn't actually driven by the high idea of hailing the hand. So uh, the minicabs emerged based on the use of telephone call centers and two-way radios. Now, uh, these are different types of, now those who have been in London know this and use this. You can only get them, you cannot hail them from the street. The only way you get them is that you have to call somewhere. Like uh, these types of things we can see on the right. 24 hours you can call them and they will come after you have called them and they go to the taxi driver. And then they use the loophole in regulations. So, so it wasn't defined as a category full enough that they could use that as a, as a loophole to actually introduce this service and it was legal. They couldn't fight against it. Because the, and so the, uh, as a result, uh, this service covered mainly suburbs and longer drives because in the center there are so many taxi cabs, it doesn't make it really, really sense to sort of call anybody. But in the, if you're in suburbs or go into the Heathrow, you will more likely call this because it's cheaper and it's nicer. So it was like a fragmented market after that. Now, then comes Uber in 2011 to London. Uh, two years after it started in San Francisco, large market makes sense. And they had a, lo a large amount of uh, venture capital backing, subsidized by drivers, both si drivers and passengers. Classic idea of two-sided market, both sides, in order to grow the market share. Uh, so many minicab drivers changed, as actually have, you have seen also in, here in Finland. Uh, people may be driving Uber and also normal taxi service now here. Uh, uh, because it, uh, they didn't have, it ate their market, not that, uh, don't just eat the uh, taxi cab market in the city itself. Uh, and uh, Uber is seen by, as a taxi company, but, but even in London, it never defined it itself one. It said that it, we are just a matching platform, we are providing this service, and uh, we don't, uh, people, this is a free country, people should be allowed to drive, offer their cars as a service to anybody who wants it, and uh, we pack it, uh, and we regulate it in the sense that there's some sort of test before you can be a driver. Uh, uh, of course, how did it happen, and how did this category emerge, which is totally different than the earlier ones, which sort of would overcome many of these challenges which relate to the, uh, these uh, social categories of taxi and related to licensing. The first one is that uh, in order to do that, you have to sort of uh, take away somehow the idea of licensing. And of course, they can rely now on, on shallow skill, set, uh, skill sets because Downloading the app is very easy. You can become a Uber driver in less than a half, a half an hour. Uh, and, and you leverage the infrastructure, the internet infrastructure for doing that. The app basically defines the service and whether you become a, a service provider. Uh, it, uh, you don't need very much the sort of skills in doing the two-way radio matching, which is the minicab, because the algorithmically do, does it. Uh, again, you leverage on the internet-based infrastructure. Uh, and you can also do that matching much more effectively based on historical data because you have large data sets. So uh, uh, that's sort of overcome also. Uh, another part of that is, of course, that the infrastructure also provides the uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, <coughs> the guidance how to drive through the city itself. That's the GPS-based services which you can get from Google Maps or anything else. So most of the sort of challenges which were part of the licenses could, could be taken away with, with, with this technological innovation. Um, the, of course, the challenge really, why you can see it, why did they do two sides of support is that in order to really provide this service and make it feasible, if you call and try to get an Uber, you would expect that you will get it in, in less than 10, 10 minutes. That's a sort of typically the cutting off point. In certain cities, it's much low, smaller than that, but that's a sort of minimum, maximum which people are willing to do. So you have to have a way to balance 
the number, uh, the number of demand and supply. So you have to have a large enough number of drivers in a certain areas in order to match with the potential number of people who want the service. And that's why they have to support on both sides. Uh, <clears throat> And of course, they, for that, they have offered the financial inducements to the drivers and customers as well as dynamic adjustments to fares on different times so that they can increase the supply of drivers, what we call the surge pricing, uh, in order to improve that uh, at a certain type of point. So if you look at uh, overall, the way in which this has worked uh, is that Uber claims that it supports independent minicab drivers to coordinate fares with customers by using central digital platform, if it's pro which it provides and controls. So that's their control point for the overall system. Uh, at the same time, they have uh, cleared, uh, based on this, because they have drawn on these uh, technical capabilities and, cap and other things, which is an innovation, they can actually say that we are not a, we are a technology company. We are uh, self-made the categorization that we are just offering the platform. It has been challenged by multiple regulators across the globe, for example, European Union and all the Uber drivers demanding minimum pay, California, uh, in, in Denmark, it was because the Denmark regulation requires that you have, you, you put, have to put a meter on the car and so forth. So there are multiple dif different ways in which this has been challenged. Uh, there's a very nice article coming by Raku Garud and others, I understand, in SNJ, I've, I've read it, uh, 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 which also looks at the emergence of the Uber in car in U.S., where he point, they point out that Uber largely worked on the shadows in each of these main markets until they reached a certain uh, minimum level of market share, and after that, they typically start even be recognized, and, they, uh, and the local city started to... Uh, uh, regulate them. Before that, they really just didn't sh uh, show on the radar screen at all. And that, uh, so they made themselves as a, uh, as a fact, as an institutional fact that we are a, mar a prominent market maker and you cannot ignore us anymore, so don't regulate us as similarly as others because we provide a very good service. That was always their argument. Of course, this hasn't made many of the taxi drivers happy, especially in New York, where in order to get medallion, like 2005, you have to pay about $3 billion, $3 to $5 million for a license. Now it costs about $50,000. So there's a lot of very angry taxi drivers who have lost their fortunes as a result of this. Uh, uh, so this is just an example of the sort of how one company was very uh, clearly always saying that Actually, everybody knows it's a taxi service, but uh, they themselves saw that we are not a taxi service. And that's the only way to sort of uh, overcome this paradox in order to build, build themselves as a, a reputable market category. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So, and without that, it, if you look at the, the case, it, it would not have been able to grow its market share and become a global player and even become a word in a sense, but it currently is. That, so that's the first case. The second case, which I'm going to go uh, and then stop. The last one is not that important. Uh, it's music. This is a little bit different story. Uh, uh, what, what is music and what common categories of characters are music experience? How do we talk about it? How do we talk about it as a consumable thing? And how it has changed over time based on the technologies which provide us the music? And how that has established certain types of markets uh, and uh, related industries? And it's not, again, a short story, because if you look at how it started, of course, music has been around since the human uh, existence. Uh, there, there are traits of music instruments and other things 10,000, 15,000 years ago. But uh, as a market, it emerged uh, in the modern age, which came with the printing. Actually, two technologies, the printing, and the other one is the industrial manufacturing of in instruments. And both of them emerged in the 17th and 18th century, a little after the Renaissance. Uh, and then, of course, at that time, it was on sheets of, of music. So you, the music experience was largely like ex expression of what you are about to he hear, but not really the, the hearing these things. And it, of course, it was uh, largely covered by the copyrights. So who had copyrights to the, these sheets of paper and who had the right to uh, print it and how you, who get money out of the, uh, printing those sheets of paper. That's how Beethoven and all, all these others make their money. Uh, <clears throat> Now, of course, all this changed uh, when uh, recorded music emerged through Edison and later on 
a phonograph, disc phonograph, electronic recording, magnetic tape, you know the story. Uh, these all actually created the idea that uh, music experience is very different. It is actually hearing how the music was played at a certain point of time as an instance. Or over an instance when you get the sound recording studio. Uh, and of course the industry was organized as a pipeline industry because the cost effective aspect was the distribution and manufacturing. Big physical barriers to that. You needed a lot of money to do that. And to create a sort of, a, a, the, a, like a printing, printing is, press is pretty similar. A lot of uh, barriers just because of the cost. So, uh, and uh, this, this industry was uh, uh, later on transformed into the sort of, uh, as a result, digitization. So with the compact these CD-ROMs, and then uh, at the end comes the iPhone, and similar experience. Uh, and all these have also uh, defined different ways or different stages in which the music experience is sort of offered in the market, and also shaped the way in which the, the, this, this pipeline model is going to be re uh, either replaced, substituted, or totally wiped out uh, in the later stages. Uh, of course, I'm going to detail, it goes back to this is technological stack and all the innovations in different layers of digital technologies which enabled all these things to be happening and the, co and the more slow and the cost reduction of the cost of the memory chips and other things and the, and the networks and so forth. But if you can look at that, uh, this is the sort of heyday of the, the pipeline situation. So, oops, sorry. So around 2001, they made about $15 billion, most of them from CDs. Uh, it's still a, a sort of physical distribution model. And, uh, and digital starts around 2001 and onwards. This is largely the sort of the first uh, part of that, which is the iPod. Plasma. Now, after that, if you look, jump 10 years ago ahead, 2012, uh, the physical, now the categories have changed. Physical is this part but it sort of goes down. Now it's about $4 billion. Most of that, by the way, is now LPs. Nothing else, CDs are gone. So the analog is back. Uh, instead, what has grown is streaming. Totally different experience. So, totally different sort of setting on idea how, what the markets are. Totally reshaping of the markets. So if you look at that over here, you can see that always the music experience was organized by in categories, types of music and their packaging in specific products. In the printed sheet period, of course, it was Opus X, Piano Sonata, Ford, like something like that. And then you get the like LP and the title and the old artist, and then the CD and title, which replaced them. That was the sort of way in which it was defined. And then, of course, the rankings and everything else followed with that. Now, uh, now the experience is shaped by categories of streaming, recommendation systems, rankings, playlists, and profiling. Totally different categories and names to characterize what where the music experience comes from and how it's defined. Uh, of course, in order to do that, in this case, it wasn't uh, licensed, so you, you, didn't, you didn't have to fight highly about it. But it required constant innovation in the categories and how they provide meaningful experience so that playlists are, are meaningful or streaming makes sense and things like that. And of course now it, it's very different. It's not so just that you push something out. It is lots of categories which enable the matching. Matching between the uh, music listener and, uh, and the music provider uh, in certain ways, which is based either based on profiles, recommendation systems, and other things. Uh, uh, and it's now similar in all content products. It's the same in TVs, movies, and news is moving to that, that type of uh, market making and related business models. Uh, I'm going to go over, over, over this uh, socialization uh, relationship, just a, a few points uh, at the end. So if you look at the overall story of this, if we try to make sense is that in order to, uh, uh, technological innovation both calls for and, and demands new types of categories in order to make them, them feasible and accessible and makers of the certain types of markets and market categories. This requires institutional work in order to uh, overcome 
or establish those categories that they are acceptable. Sometimes if they are regulated and licensed, it may require all types of skunk, skunk works, illegal activity, all types of things in order that may to happen. Uh, uh, it also is a long process and demands negotiation between innovators, regulators, and many times consumers, depending how, it's, how they are defined. It's not the same as, you know, the social, social shaping of technology studies where people locally try to make sense of technology. That's, that's not the story. The story is here, the big story, that at the industry level or societal level, you have to establish these categories through some type of institutional work. And you have to enable these types of positioning of these categories as meaningful and useful for certain actors to make them attractive and legitimate for those. And if you look at these three cases, they are very different. The first one, which was a license case, you can say that it was largely hide and grow and, uh, until it establishes a new old category or just deviate from that if it's possible. That, was, that has been the Uber strategy because it's a highly regulated license environment. If you look at the music industry, it shift and learn with the business model innovation replaced and replaced them with the older categories. And much of that actually was bottom up, like uh, social construction. Over, over time of these types of innovations by different innovators and then making them public. And because it's not uh, uh, reg highly regulated, this is possible. Uh, if you look at the social re relationship thing, which is the sort of like, so like Instagram and, uh, and Facebook, there's this of of new idea of, sort of friends and social relationships, which you have in Facebook. They are not your real friends. They just appear to be your friends. Uh, it's a, it's a new way of sort of socially defining what a friend is. And similarly, the relationships that you have there are not really the types of social relations which you have in face-to-face -face social setting. But we call them social relationships. And of course, there's, there's a benefit from that because you can expand your service and you can expand your networks and you know all types of things that you didn't know before. But as Ubov points out, there's a, there's a sort of side story, a hidden story, is that all that that you do becomes so. Uh, computable fact, computational reality, which can be categorized by others and sold. And it can be also used to manipulate and socially engineer behaviors. And that's a sort of a other opposite side of what the social re really means. So you have at the, at, at the same time in this one category, the opposites, the social and non-social. Uh, and, and the social is only possible because you have the non-social. It's a different type, and you, in order to make that work, you have to have both. That's the sort of challenge in, in the business models in all of these social, uh, social media sites. Uh, uh, sort of if, just to summarize, so which type of paradox and strategy applies to different settings? You can see that we just look at the different settings, but there's probably more to that than these three. Uh, one of them seems to be the level of regulation, the other one seems to be whether it's a totally novel category or other type of uh, setting where you want to get. We need to study more in detail specific strategies and tactics to deal with this paradox. We didn't have the data. We would have to look at the actor based data in settings in order to understand how they, they deal with that. The best I know on this work is the Raku Karu's work on Uber uh, and, and changing that. Uh, and of course, uh, as we move along, it's an interesting question that most of these examples are purely digital examples, other than the first one, which is a matching in the physical world. Uh, but as we move more towards Internet of Things and this uh, embedding of the digital into the, our social life, our homes and other things, the question is going to be largely is that what types of paradoxes and what types of uh, all, uh, aspect we have to uh, overcome in, in those types of settings and related services. So, uh, this, this big figure is a little bit paradoxical because it says that turn that way, but actually it turns that way. So it's, so it's pretty much the same as the type of story which you have to tell many times when, when you look at this digital innovation. So, thank you very much for your uh, interest and attention on this topic. Thank you.